What is up, everybody, and how's it going? I'm Alex Goldstick, and you are listening to the Spring Forward Podcast. The biggest weekend of the football calendar is here, but we're looking slightly past the big game and towards the following weekend, when the XFL gets underway and more Spring League alumni will achieve the professional dreams they've been working towards their whole lives. Today's episode features one of those players who will take his first steps onto a football field as an active roster professional in just one week. Before we get to the interview, we're coming up fast on spring, which means the spring league is about to ramp back up. This year, before we get to the actual spring league flagship event, the league will be putting on an exhibition game in Frisco, Texas against the Japan National American football team. In 2019, five Japanese nationals competed at the Spring League's events, and we got to see inside a country's football culture, which most of us didn't know existed. It's a country full of football talent, and we'll see that on full display against a team of hand-selected Spring League alumni on March 1st. Stay tuned to the Spring League social media channels for ticket availability for that game, which will take place at the Dallas Cowboys practice facility, better known as the Star. Following the game, the Spring League will be moving from Austin, Texas, where it's been the previous two years, to Las Vegas. Applications are still open for any prospective players wishing to participate. The only way to get an invitation to the Spring League in Las Vegas is to apply. A link to the application can be found at thespringleague.com. Now, time to get to the interview. Without further ado, Hunter Nicewander. Hunter Nicewander is a punter out of Northwestern University who is currently getting ready to make his week one debut with the DC Defenders of the XFL. He's an alumni of the 2019 Spring League in Austin and before that had spells with the Chicago Bears and Pittsburgh Steelers. Perhaps most importantly, the Peninsula Ohio native is the first punter to be featured on the Spring Forward podcast, so feel free to add that to your trophy case, Hunter. Uh, welcome to the pod. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. I didn't know I was the first punter, but it's a heck of an honor. Well, so let's clear this up off the bat that you are, in fact, Hunter, and that does rhyme with punter. And there's no question here, just an acknowledgement of what you have to go through every time you do an interview. And I'm going to keep it rolling, if that's cool with you. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good with me. All right. So uh, you're a big dude, 6'5", 240, at least according to the Northwestern Athletic Department. Um, so why punting and kicking with that kind of size? Yeah, so actually I've shed a few pounds since my Northwestern days, and I'm probably down to 230 right now. But um, I got into punting and kicking originally back in high school as a soccer player. Um, and I played, I grew up playing football, so I football, tackle football till around seventh grade, and I wanted to get back into it, play with my friends in high school. And so I took up kicking originally about a week before the start of uh, my freshman year. And then my sophomore year, I decided to take on punting too, and from there, I just really enjoyed it. I had no idea that there were even offers for college, full ride offers at that point. It was just for fun. I wanted to play with my friends. Um, and then eventually I started getting letters in the mail. I was like, what? This is a real thing. And from there, just my passion grew. And I decided to just go full speed ahead with it. Right. I mean, so so from kicking around and playing with your friends to high school, you broke the state record in Ohio for consecutive point after attempts um, at 111 in a row. Um, you were ranked by scout.com as the number 12 place kicking prospect in the country. Uh, so I'm assuming Northeast Ohio, where you're from, is solidly Big Ten country. And you eventually chose Northwestern, as we covered, which is in the Big Ten. Um, so take us through high school recruiting for you. You mentioned the letters started coming. Yeah, so after my sophomore year, actually, I started getting letters. Um, and I went to my coach. I was like, can I get recruited for this like what do these letters mean and he's like yeah you can actually get a full ride just kicking or punting in college and so from there I talked to my parents I'm like I think I really want to pursue this and they were excited because actually my dad was a big Ohio State fan and my mom was a big Michigan State fan so of course I had to take the middle ground and go to Northwestern um, and thankfully they're they're both Cats fans now um, so it was a really exciting time, but also just brand new to my parents, to me. So um, there was a lot, a lot of prayers going on during that time, a lot of traveling. Um, so it was very exciting, but also uh, a lot of work went into it for sure. Well, and I think out of those three schools, you probably ended uh, you ended your career with the best degree possible as well if we had Northwestern. Exactly. It might sound cliche, but it's the best combination of football and academics out there. 
So we insured you as a punter, um, but you know a lot of these high school statistics and your recruitment um, also included kicking. At what point did you begin to focus solely on punting, at least as far as game action goes? And we'll get to the spring league, and I know you did a little bit of both there too. Yeah, yeah. So I, I got to college doing all three. Um, and after my redshirt year, I kind of sat down with uh, my head coach at Northwestern, Coach Fitzgerald, and because he was our special teams coordinator as well. So he's who I met with on a daily basis. Um, and I sat down with him and we kind of talked about, you know, what, what my goals looked like. And I talked about playing at the next level and pursuing, uh, pursuing it professionally. And we both decided that it, it was the best thing to do to focus on one of those skill sets. So I, I decided that, you know, it looked like at that point that, um, I was able to develop better as a punter with my size and, um, strength and everything. And so I decided to just go all in with punting. Now, it seems to me like punters probably have less obvious highlights or things that stand out to them in games um, over, you know, the typical skill positions. So what what's the biggest play, moment, game that sticks with you to this day from Northwestern, whether that's a, a trick play mm-hmm. or I know you have an 80-yard punt to your name, a bowl win, <laughs> something like that? Yeah, so I think there's two punts that come to mind. The first one um, was back in the pinstripe bowl back in 2016. Um, there's about two minutes and some change left and we're backed up in our own end zone. I was in the back of the end zone punting out of there. Um, and we're punting to an all American returner. So I knew I had to get off a great punt. We were up by like, I think three or four points at this time. I knew if, if it was a poor punt that I'd give the other team pit an opportunity to score. So, um, I remember getting off a 50 something yard punt and the returner didn't get much out of it at all. And our defense held it up. And we ended up winning the game. So that one definitely sticks out of my mind. In Yankee Stadium. Um, and then, a, go ahead. In Yankee Stadium, too, pinch tray pole. In Yankee Stadium, yes, yes. That was an amazing experience in of itself. Um, and then, of course, the 80 yard punt was pretty amazing. Again, a uh, close game against Iowa. And so to just help the team and be able to do something special like that at home against Iowa was uh, definitely memorable for me. So in in the little less than a year between graduation and the spring league in March 2019, uh, you experience what it's like to be on the inside of two of the the cornerstone foundational franchises of the NFL in the Bears and then the Steelers. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how those opportunities materialized and what the first taste of the NFL was like or any professional football? Yeah, so I had to work out with the Bears and that was really cool just getting to go right down the road, really. Um, I had a few of my teammates there. And it was really cool to see what that was like, get inside the locker room and uh, perform in front of uh, an NFL coach. Um, and then with the Steelers, I was in mini camp with them. And so really getting to spend uh, a few days in that organization, I would say, you know, two of the top organizations within the NFL uh, was really cool and amazing blessing and uh, definitely a learning experience for me. I think I took a lot away from both of those experiences that uh, will help me in the future when I get back in to an NFL locker room and opportunity. Absolutely. And, and so that brings us to the Spring League, um, which you attended in 2019, March 2019 in Austin. Um, that's the league's flagship event of the year, where you took up punting duties for the uh, probably the one-and-done Austin Generals. I don't have any inside information on that, though. Um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the Spring League's moving to, to, uh, to Vegas, so we're, they're not going back oh, to that's Austin. Right. Yeah. That's right. But so how did you find out about the Spring League and ultimately decide to accept the invite? Uh, well, I remember seeing news about Johnny Manziel playing in it, of course. Um, and as a free agent, uh, I was looking for opportunities to put myself out there and um, get some film and get in front of coaches. And I saw the Spring League, um, and I remember just kind of scrolling through the page, looking at what it was about and what it entailed, and uh, just deciding that this would be a, a cool opportunity to participate in. And um, so I sent an email to the Spring League, and they actually sent back an invite. So from there, I was like, heck, yeah, I'll do this. Um, and got down to Austin, and um, it was a really exco- cool experience being down there, getting to uh, perform in front of the XFL. It was ran by the XFL. So I knew it was going to be a good opportunity to get in front of meaningful eyes, Um and, of course, getting to play live games again is, is always fun. Yeah, obviously, football is a sport where it, it's pretty hard to play pickup or get film and, and refs and pads and helmets and all that. 
Um, so that's certainly what the Spring League uh, aims to do. Uh, one of those Spring League games was a punting clinic for the ages, which you know sadly means that there was not a lot of good offense. Um, <laughs> but on the flip side, you and, and fellow punter Jonathan Hernandez had a field day. So what has stuck with you from that experience almost a year later? Yeah, so I got to room with John down in Austin, and we both had a great time and connected. Um, and it was fun just to compete in, against another guy, another friend, um, and of course, like you said, the, the offenses weren't doing too well, but it, it was fun to just get out there on the field and compete against another guy like that. As you just alluded to, um, the spring league you attended in Austin was the first time the spring league had an official affiliation with a pro league, um, that pro league being the XFL. Uh, so they obviously had a lot of presence there. They were, they were doing some testing on rules some testing on broadcasting, um, did you have any indication from your time in Texas that the league was interested in you specifically? Yeah, so I was able to have a few conversations with some coaches down there. Um, so I was hoping at that point that those were meaningful conversations that would hopefully turn into a workout or, you know, just an opportunity to showcase my abilities again in front of these coaches. So um, it's really cool to look back now at those conversations and um, where I'm at today, it's, it's really cool to see just kind of that step in the process that I'm in. Many of the XFL new rules that they're proposing to the game of football um, occur on special teams plays, whether it be the halo rule for punts, um, which we see in the CFL, uh, or a new formation for kickoffs to hopefully limit injuries. And a lot of those rules were tested in Austin when you were there. Um, what's your take on the rule changes the XFL will be playing with, and I guess specifically the special teams ones? Yeah, so I think it's really interesting the the kickoff rule, especially with guys being five yards apart. I think it's a brilliant idea to minimize those injuries, but also still have that exciting play in football. I don't think the kickoff should ever get removed from the game of football. I think it's a spectacular play that offers a lot of excitement. I think the XFL did did a smart thing to keep that in play and keep that a part of the game, but in a new uh, format that emphasizes player safety. I think that's huge in today's age. Um, but then also I think it's a challenge for me as a punter with the new rules. Obviously you can't kick it out of bounds. Um, there's uh, a limit. You can't run downfield until the ball is kicked. Um, touchbacks go to the 35. So with these new challenges, it, it tunes my game and helps me focus on, you know, hang time and ball placement and making sure I give my coverage the best opportunity to get down there. So I think it's a challenge that uh, I'm happy to take on. And uh, I think challenges keep, keep you motivated and keep you excited and engaged. So uh, I'm excited to get after it. There, there are a bunch of spring league players in the XFL. So maybe, maybe the guys who were, who were with the spring league in 2019 have a bit of a head start, but um, it, it's not every day a new league comes along, especially not a new league that's proposing uh, different rules. So um, we'll skip ahead a little bit here to, to training camp, but how have they taught the league and the players these new rules and the reasoning behind them and, and how to think about them at game speed? Yeah, so, I mean, we had, we had meetings about it with our head coach, and then we broke it down, of course, into special teams meeting with the special teams coordinator, and then we would walk through them initially and then um, work on them in practice, and we were able to have a few preseason scrimmages while we were down there where it was live reps, live game action, where we were able to work on them. So it's exciting to see how those things, those plays, uh, those rules have come full circle, and, and now we're you know about a week away from our first game, which is really exciting. Skip ahead a little to October 2019. The D.C. Defenders took you in the open phase of the, of the XFL draft. Uh, for the record, even though they separated um, sort of in a nice, innovative way the draft phases by positional group for, for balance of ultimate rosters, um, there wasn't one for specialists. So all specialists were taken in the open round. Um, how did you find out you had been selected, and what was that moment like? Um, so I was actually – I knew that open draft phase was uh, the time that I could potentially get a call – so I actually went with my father-in-law that morning to go golfing um, and we got lunch afterwards and I got back in the cold rainy day and I was literally about to hop in the shower and uh, I got the call from DC. Um, I was just so excited in the moment I ran back and um, told my father-in-law and called my wife. So it was a really called my family, called my parents and it was a really exciting day that I, I definitely won't forget. And, um, 
a very meaningful day for for all of us and just the the work that I've put into it, the support from my wife. It it was a step in the process that really showed um, just the work that put that I put into it and how um, how it all paid off at that point. And how'd you shoot on the course that day? Uh, like I said, it was cold and rainy, so um, <laughs> slightly above my average score. I think I was still in the 40s, though, for nine, so I'll take it. I would take that for sure. Um, <laughs> so uh, Pep Hamilton, your your head coach in D.C., um, was one of the most present XFL coaches during all three of the official camps the Spring League ran with the XFL. Um, so maybe it's not a surprise then that all three defender specialists are Spring League alumni, that being yourself, um, place kicker Tyler Rousa from the Spring League 2018, um, and long sn- snapper Brian Curry, who was with the Spring League for two events uh, over 18 and 19. Um, so have you three discussed your Spring League connection at all? I know the Spring League has been posting a lot about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's pretty cool to just see how um, all of our stories came to this point, came together in D.C., and how the Spring League definitely was a big part of that for each of us. And- and then the, the XFL in general, you know, startup life is something that's almost put on this pedestal in corporate America in this day and age. Um, and you're getting to be a part of that as an active athlete, maybe not so much corporate, but, uh, you know, a startup nonetheless. Is there a camaraderie amongst the league's players, spring league or otherwise, about undertaking this new venture together? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of excitement and um, guys are motivated and excited to get back on the field for for these football games that, you know, mean so much to us. A lot of these guys, you know, play the Spring League, play in the NFL, play in the CFL, um, and we're now all in the XFL. So um, it's a really exciting opportunity for each of us to show what we can do. And, um, yeah, definitely uh, motivated to get back out there week one. Now, similarly to the Spring League that you were a part of, um, the XFL had training camp a few weeks ago with every team in the same spot in Houston. Um, so did you all practice together? Did you all just happen to be in the same city for scrimmage purposes? How integrated were the practices, um, among teams? So like you said, we were all in Houston, but we had our own individual practice locations. And then we were able to meet up for, um, a few combined practices and then a few preseason games that were all held at the university of Houston's football stadium. So now for the fun part, you know, of all the XFL teams, the defenders got a bit of a popularity boost when PFT commentator, uh, sorry, PFT commenter from Barstool's Pardon My Take tried out with the team during kicker tryouts, which also, as a side note, was supposed to include Chad Ochocinco, but he didn't show up. Um, <laughs> given Barstool's reach and the PMT guys love for all things football, any type of football, uh, you got a lot of camera time as PFT's holder uh, and possible future teammate, although we just mentioned Tyler, so we know that didn't work out. Um, so take us behind the scenes of that experience and, and maybe some of the clout you've received since then. Yeah. So our media guy came up to me and told me that he was coming in and kind of debriefed me on what was going to happen. Um, and it was during the day of one of our preseason games and, uh, I get out there warming up and kind of getting ready for the game. And I didn't know, I knew he was coming that day, but I had no idea he was coming actually during our preseason game. So I finished warming up and I come to the sideline and, he comes up to me, he's like, hey, I'm PFT. I'm like, oh, wait, you're actually here. He had on his single bar mask, and uh, he's a lot shorter than I. I, <laughs> I didn't know he was so tiny. Uh, but he was really, really nice, genuine dude, pretty funny. He said he was still hungover from the national championship game um, down in New Orleans. So that might have been the reason why he didn't kick quite as well as we had hoped, but um, it was still a lot of fun, and he actually did pretty well. I mean, he made some kicks. He made a 30-yarder, a 35-yarder, but he's definitely not uh, He's not Tyler Rosa. And <laughs> where did he come up with the with the old-school defender's garb, considering you guys uh, haven't even started yet? Yeah, I don't know where he got that from, but I was pretty jealous. The single bar face mask, I haven't seen one of those in a long time, so I, I might have to look into that. <laughs> Now, uh, in a brand new league, it's hard for the public to get a sense of the teams and how they rank against each other. Uh, you know, I'll leave the real analysis and rankings to Vegas, but heading into week one at home against Seattle, um, take off your helmet and put on your analyst cap, especially given that you might have seen a cross-section of the league in Houston. Um, how do you believe the defenders stack up against the rest of the league, and what, we should, what, what should we look for on Saturday against the Dragons? Uh, I think we have a really awesome group of guys who love to compete they're super physical 
Um, and the camaraderie is great right now. I think uh, we're, we're getting to the point where it's a real family amongst everyone. Um, and I think at this point we're all itching to get out there on the game field. So we'll be excited to be the first game of this new XFL season. Um, and I have a few former teammates on college teammates on Seattle. So it'll be fun to see them and compete against them. And I know the punter for Seattle as well. So it'll be fun to punt against him. Um, so just a lot of excitement. And I think we're really ready to get out there. So I actually went to school in DC uh, when the Nationals and DC United still played at RFK Stadium. So please don't look up, look that up when that was. It was a long time ago. <laughs> um, but now you're sharing a brand new stadium where DC United play called Audi Field, which is what they call a soccer specific stadium. And you're not the first football team to play in one. The Chargers just played in one for two years in LA. Um, are there any quirks associated with a stadium built for another sport? What are your impressions of the stadium that's brand new it's one year old so we actually just had a meet the team event there so we were able to see our locker room see the field and um it's natural grass it's a beautiful soccer pitch so i'm really excited i love playing on grass and uh it kind of feels like home back to my soccer days so i really like that atmosphere i think the stands are right on top of the field which are is going to be really cool for the fans they are going to be so close to the game and it'll be cool for us too because we're going to be able to hear them i think it's going to be a pretty loud uh, intimate environment, which will be really fun, and uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we can defend it well. <laughs> well, yeah, I see what you did there. That was nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, on that note, let's leave the people with your best XFL plug heading into Week One. Hey, it's all about for the love of football. For the love of football. Beautiful. Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, you know, if 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 you. Football ends on Sunday, although I'm not sure when this pod is coming out. Um, NFL ends on Sunday. Football does not end. Uh, XFL will kick off with a ton of Spring League alum, um, but especially check out the the punting, the kicking, the kickoffs on the defenders because those are all three Spring League guys featuring uh, Hunter Nicewander. Awesome. Definitely do that. <laughs> All right, that will do it for this episode of Spring Forward. Hunter and the rest of the XFL are furiously preparing for the XFL's launch, and I can't thank him enough for the time he took out of his schedule to talk to us. You can follow the Spring League on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at the Spring League. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Alex Goldstick. All music was provided to the Spring Forward podcast by Joshua Rosner. Until next time, later. Later.